Hi, so this demo is going to show you how you can take uh, two images and composite them into a third. The idea is to take a background image from around the school and generate for yourself a green screen uh, photo of something extraordinary that you've made, in this case in 3D modeling uh, using animator and a flying saucer. Put them together with some shadows and depth cues to make a believable, if not realistic, uh, photo that combines the two. So here, here's where it all starts. First off, we're going to need to find ourselves a picture, a background picture, and start there. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this right back to square one, get rid of this picture, and see if I can locate that picture right off the bat. This is the one that I was going to use. We tried to find an area that was big enough, tried to uh, actually measure the angle on the camera and stuff too. So it was very, very predictable. And try to find an instance where there was lots of shadows, because a little bit of shadow kind of helps to sell this, this effect a bit. So there's our starting place. Uh, the next place to go to is that we have to find uh, an image in Animator that's going to match this thing. Remembering we got this photo, I'll show you how we put this one together. So I'm going to bring up Animator. And in Animator, I've already modeled the flying saucer that I'm going to use. And we've already gotten into the idea of creating scenes. And scenes lets us put a background image in behind there. So what we're going to do is make a brand new scene. I'm going to give it a name and I'm going to call this Schoolyard. And in this one, I'm going to introduce that, uh, that background that we did here by going to Settings Environment. I can push an image into the background of it, and I'm going to load that image up, presuming I can find it pretty easily. Oh, there it is. Now it's a high res image, so it's going to take a little time as it loads the thing up. The high res image, though, is going to let us print this on a poster size if we want. You notice right away I forgot to take away the ground grid, and that happens under settings environment as well. So I'm going to turn off that ground grid so we can actually see what we're looking at. Good. Got a great start to this. Next, we want to introduce uh, our flying saucer to this. So this happens in scene mode. This happens under render, no, sorry, build, add object. And my object I want to put in there is the saucer. And already, it's, it's not too far off the, off the map. Now, this is not a bad plan for getting this thing to line up believably and making kind of sense. I'm going to put that ground grid back on. And you can see the ground grid is kind of uh, giving us clues as to how this thing should be set up. If I go into quad view, and I make sure that I'm looking at that sort of sneak preview there, I could adjust the camera angle to match what was going on before. And I might even try to doctor this thing up so it looks like what it should look like. First of all, the camera looks like it's kind of further off the ground and maybe further away than what we originally had here. It looks like the angle of the camera is a little extreme, so I'm going to rotate it back. And lo and behold, you can kind of adjust this thing. You don't have to, but it's going to lend some... some uh, improvements to the whole thing. I'm going to move this over. I'm actually going to see if I can... I have never tried this before. I'm going to see if I can actually rotate this thing so it kind of matches that. So I'm rotating the camera and moving it around a little bit just to kind of match that up and I, I can approximate where that grid should be. Kind of matching the plane too and it looks like even still I've got to rotate this camera up a little bit to flatten it out. Kind of neat like this. Remember, you got to take little steps as you move this thing around. Now, that camera is way far away now. Looks like i got to rotate it down. And I, again, I don't know if this is really worth it, but it's kind of cool. Okay, so I've sort of duplicated the environment there where that, uh, where that ground might be. It, like I say, don't go too crazy on this, but I'm going to see if this makes things any easier. So now I'm going to start adjusting this flying saucer to sort of match. Now I've got something that's going to be a little easier. So first of all, I'm going to move it off the ground like this. And then I'm going to use the scale tool and make it bigger. Makes sense that that thing is a little more on the ginormous size. And I'll move it around a little bit so it's roughly placed where I want it to be. And now I'm going to take away that ground grid and see how it's matching up at this point. And lo and behold, yeah, it looks like it's going to be okay. And I'll take it out of quad view because I think I've made those arrangements. So all this has done for me is given me uh, roughly where this thing should be. But now I want to try to duplicate things like shadows and stuff to match the environment. And looking at this, it looks like the shadows are coming from this side of the screen. So I'm going to go to this, and I'm going to build in uh, a light. And the light I'll choose to use, I'll call it sun, just for the fun of it. And I'm going to make sure it's an infinite light, and I'm going to choose its color to be as white as white gets. So it's nice and bright. Say OK. And the neat thing about infinite light is it doesn't matter where you put it. It matters what angle you put it at. And I know this, the sunlight's coming at it kind of like this. If I looked at it from the top view, it seems to me that it was also kind of coming from the back a little bit like this. I'll move this off in this direction. And as you build these things, you can put qualities like shadows and things to it. So I'm going to double click this light 
And under its advanced characteristics, I'm going to allow it to cast some shadows here too, using volume. Ray trace is very slow. Volume ought to do the job for us. And say OK. Now this object here, this object actually won't do anything with that, those shadows unless you turn the shadows on for the flying saucer. So I'm going to allow this saucer to cast shadows and receive it so it can cast shadows on itself. And I'll go back to the camera's view for this. Nothing looks any different just yet. But if I do a quick render of this thing in a slow, in a, in a low res anti-aliased, I'll do this really fast, you can see we're starting to get the light sources roughly where we would expect them to be, just like that. Okay, so getting better and better. Uh, only other thing I might want to try playing around with, let's see, there's, there's lots of things that we can mess with. Um, there is somewhere in here, there's something called ambient light render image, and I wish I could remember exactly where it was. Is it under the scene? Is it under movie image? Nuts. Doing that would brighten everything up because I notice it's looking a little bit dark and moody. I'm going to do something else for its reflections though. I might put in another light over on the other side. So on this side I've got sunlight. On the other side I've got a building that's sort of orange in color. And so I'm going to build in another light. It's not going to be very bright. This is going to be a building reflection because there's a lot of light that comes reflected off the building. And the color of that light I think was sort of in the orangey tones and really kind of dark. It doesn't have to be very bright. Now I'm going to make this thing into a local light. So it's a light that doesn't have any direction. It just matters where the thing is located. And I know that building is sort of located way off here somewhere. Something like that. So there'll be a little bit of a reflection from the thing. And it'll be subtle, but we'll try to put it together. So we're just about there. We just about have, have everything that we need. And um, I think I'm going to go ahead and try to set this thing up for the resolution we want it to be and turn it into a green screen. And notice it's matching the size here really well. It would be handy to know exactly how big the original picture is. And I've got it loaded into Photoshop. I can see it's 28 by 21, 000, uh, 2100 pixels. 2816 by 2112. Holy smokes. 2816, eh? Okay, so I'm going to go to Settings and I'm going to go to Movie Image. And I think it's a 4x3 picture. 4x3. 2816, and I've got a rough approximation of the right size. It doesn't have to be exactly the right, the same size, but it's going to have about the same amount of detail as the original, so I'll leave it at that. And now I'm going to go ahead and render it. I'll try to put this in again. 2816 by 20, I think it was about 2012. Uh, I'm going to do it without anti-aliasing just yet, and I'm eventually going to set this background to being green, as green as green gets, so it's a green screen. So I'll just try this and see what it's going to look like. Without anti-aliasing on, it's going to go pretty quickly. It's also zoomed way in. I can see, ah, oh, I've still got that, that background showing up here. So I'll close this and go turn off the image and change it instead to a solid color and choose that color again to be green. This is the right place to do it, I guess. Now, notice I've chosen a color where there's no outside edges that are green. His helmet is, but this shouldn't be too bad. The ground grid is off. Go back to render, try it again. And what I get is uh, a saucer that's at just about the right angle for matching that photo. Now this is aliased, so it's all jaggedy and stuff. I'm happy with that. I'm going to do it one more time. I'm going to click that image button. This time I'm going to say, do it anti-aliased. Now it's generating it, just doing that. It's now generating a correct version of it, anti-aliased, and you'll see it's going to get really smooth in a second. And you got to be patient for this anti-aliased stuff. You want to set everything up without anti-aliased on. It's much faster to make sure that you got the lights, do a little proof of the thing. As you see the scan line go through, you're going to see it start to clean up these lines. Anti-alias makes things much smoother in appearance. Same resolution, just it's using half steps and, sh and shading between different contrasting parts to remove those jaggedy bits. So now we got ourselves something that looks good. And now it's time to save it. And I'm going to save this as a JPEG. Better make sure I put it in a proper place. This is going to be my, I think I'll call this green screen saucer version 2, because this is another version I've tried putting together. And the quality, let's make it as good as it'll get, 100%. And say OK. And it should have saved it by now. So I'll hit close. And now I'm just going to go and open that file up. Right here with the others. There it is. Open her up. And now it's time to put the things together. That's the hard part. Photoshop is actually kind of the easy part once you get to know how Photoshop works. So I'm going to start putting that together right now. The Photoshop steps, I want to 
get rid of the green. Actually, what I want to do is get the saucer. To get the saucer, I'm going to use a magic wand tool. I've got a tolerance of about 20. I've got contiguous selection, so it's only going to select around the outside. And it's just selected everything around the saucer. And now if I go select and inverse, now it's grabbed just the saucer. With the move tool, I can grab and move this from one frame to the other, and it's just about the same size, and the lighting is matching. So I'm pretty happy with that result. So there's step one. Don't need this thing anymore. Get rid of it. And I'll just concentrate on this photo now. Now I'm going to name this saucer. The components of this are just a saucer, a background, and in between some shadows. So I'm going to invent a new layer, and I'll call it shadows just to keep track of things. And the easy way of putting shadows in with this, I think, is to learn this trick of control clicking a layer right where its icon appears. So control clicking saucer gives me a selection of just the saucer area. I'm still on the shadows layer. I'm going to hide the saucer for a sec. And now I'd like to fill it up with black. If I tap the D key or click this button, it defaults black to the front. That's the normal default color of foreground background. And if I hold Alt and tap the delete key, it fills black anywhere on the current layer where I am within the selected area. So I've just got myself a shadow really, really quickly. Now it's not going to be very believable because shadows are not 100% opaque. If you grab that and drag it on down to about, let's say about, let's try 35% and see what that looks like. And then move it down onto the pavement where it should be. We see, start to see it looks like a shadow, a little more like a shadow that we have here. We can adjust that later too. Shadows are going to be on the same plane is what we were doing here. So I'm going to squish this down like that so it looks like it's on the, roughly the same plane. Now this is not physically accurate to what the shadow would appear like, but I'm going to elongate it a little bit and it's going to do for now. And say OK. And I'll deselect it with Control D. And I'll turn on the saucer just to see how it's appearing. So yeah, I'm getting a good little fake in there. Now other qualities of that shadow to make it look a little more believable should be a little feathered, a little blurred. And I can blur it very easily making sure I've chosen the right layer first. I'll go to Filter, I'll go to Blur, and by the way I deselected before I did this because if you don't deselect it's not going to blur it effectively. Blur, Gaussian Blur, and I've chosen a value. That's 6. 6 is a little bit heavy in this case. There is a shadow there but it's got a little bit of sharpness. Maybe I'll take it, try taking it to a 3 so it's a little bit on the blurry side. And there's, um, there's almost all the steps complete. We've got a shadow, we've got our saucer. The last thing that we're going to do is we've got a telltale fringe around the outside of this saucer. And if I go into 100%, you can really see it 100%. Yeah, it's still there. So now we're going to defringe. I'm going to go back to the saucer. And to defringe it, I'm going to use that trick again. Control and clicking the icon selects the opaque pixels of the saucer layer. Now here's the trick. I'm going to use select and I'm going to blur that edge with a feather and I'm only going to feather it by one pixel and say OK. doesn't look any different. Now I'm going to do that select inverse and instead of choosing the inside of the saucer I've chosen the area around the saucer but now with a blur. And to see the effect of what I'm going to do next I'm going to hide the selection. It's still going to be there. It's just going to be hidden with a control H. And when you hit the delete key it's still selecting the empty pixels on the saucer layer outside but because it's blurred the green starts to go away. I just deleted once, twice, three times, four times, five times. And I seem to have gotten rid of most of it. I can see a little speck of green in there that I could probably get rid of just by erasing it. But I've gotten, given myself a fairly clean selection around it. Be careful with that feather. If it's any more than one pixel, it'll start to look like it's actually sort of invisible around the outside edges, and you probably don't want that. So there's all the steps. There's the idea of trying to complete this. There's lots more that you can do with it. You know, the saucer itself is looking a little crisp and cartoony compared to the subjects there. So I like to do other things like enhance the color and go to the saturation and actually remove some of the color with de by desaturating it. So dulling it down. Oh, remember that hidden selection? I just desaturated the selected area on the outside. Control H and I can see what I was doing there. Yeah, Control D before you try any of this stuff. Deselect or it won't work. Now I'll try it again. Adjust color, saturation. Now when I bring it down, I can gray out the background color so it's a little less cartoony and a little more realistic. Kind of matches what's going on in the environment. And the other thing I might do is just because these guys look up, they appear a little bit blurred, I could do the same thing with the saucer itself. Just a little bit of blur so it looks like a camera flaw, a little camera motion or something. And obviously three is too much. One is even too much. 
Let's try 0.2 or 0.5. It's just a little bit of blur to try to make the thing look like it blends in and fits that original photo. So there you go. That's all the way through the saucer composite exercise. Uh, naturally, the ne next thing you want to do is save this for the web. And when you save it for the web, you may consider how big you really want it. If it's poster size and you want to send this off to get printed, you might want to keep all those pixels. If you want to put it onto your website as an 800, I'm going to constrain this, 800 by 600, that might be the way to do it. So I'll hit apply. It'll shrink it down. And I'll save it that way. And now it's ready to go on my portfolio site. Good luck. Try it for yourself.